We spent a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown, out there on the edge of the prairie. It's been cold out there this last week when we had Lincoln's birthday on Monday, not that anybody noticed it, and, um, and then Valentine's Day with all of its painful memories for some of us. And uh, now President's Day coming up, whatever it may be, President's Day, Washington and Lincoln's wedding day, I guess it, <laughs> it's what it is. They used to hang on the front of our classroom, the two of them side by side, and when we were very small children, we did think they were man and wife. <laughs> Washington looked kind of like a woman with kind of a white wig, and he had kind of a fierce look in his eye that some of us associated with some of the older aunts. Lincoln there beside him looking so sad and so soulful. And it was always kind of a little corrective when you looked up from your work to see them looking at you, and their eyes followed you wherever you went in the room. Washington and Lincoln. Washington gave you a ferocious look. You looked up, and he looked at you, and he said, get your head back down there. Get to work on that. It's going to happen to you. You can't figure that out. Come on. Get to work. And you did, and then you looked up, and there was Lincoln looking at you with that sad look in his eye that said, it doesn't matter, because you're probably going to be hit by a truck later anyway, so <laughs> don't bother learning that, just to have a good time. I don't think they hang on classroom walls anymore, front of the classroom. I don't think classrooms have a front as such anymore. It's not, it's not a holistic idea. I think the kids probably all face in towards the middle so that you don't have somebody with the feeling that they're sitting in the back of the room, you know. <laughs> so you don't have any kind of hierarchical thing <laughs> going on. Probably just kids have their own work around on the walls around them. and and. Adults don't look at children in the same way that Washington and Lincoln looked at us from the wall. That was ferocious. But I remember adults looking, giving us those looks. And that was the only discipline you needed when you were a small child. Somebody give you that look. Yeah, I'm looking at you right now. <laughs> I noticed that person sit up there in the audience. I used to run around and play uh, in a ravine. There's outside of town, a whole gang of us did, and we'd run around, and we were, we were cavalry. We were, we were Jeb Stewart's cavalry riding against uh, General Sheridan and his Union troops. And General Lee had sent us out to reconnoiter. We ran around in the ravines, through the weeds, and along this dry creek bed, and around through the trees. And I loved this. And I loved to ride around with a kerchief on, and kind of galloping on my horse, you know, even though I was 10, 12 years old and still enjoyed it. And I enjoyed dying. I enjoyed those Matthew Brady photographs from the war and soldiers lying dead on the field. And I was good at dying. Somebody shoot me in the chest, I'd take the bullets and I'd writhe around and I'd fall, twitch for a little bit. I remember one afternoon I heard a crack of a twig right after I'd fallen dying and it was a crack made by a heavier foot than a child's foot and I looked up and it was Mr. Stenstrom standing there and he gave me that look. He said, are you okay? I said, yeah. He said, get up. I did. I never rode with the cavalry ever again. <laughs> I never died after that. I just lived a kind of a serious adult life, the same life I'm living now. It was just that one glance told you that, that childhood is over. It was cold uh, this last week and beautiful driving around. We had a little fresh snow and so the white fields undulating as you drove around the back roads around town and the tree line off a quarter mile, half mile off oak and spruce and poplar and maple and 
the old farm places, came across this farm in ruins. So sad to see a farm in ruins and the barn, the paint peeling on it and the roof starting to fall in and the house about to follow it and the fence wire all tangled up and curled and stone foundations starting to come apart, an old hay rack kind of leaning, about to collapse, sheds that are kind of like piles of lumber just about to implode. Sad to see because you knew that years ago some man and woman had put their life and soul into this farm and people who, for whom upkeep was a basic part of being decent and Christian. It would have just killed them to see this. Luckily, they're dead, but a sad thing, and you think about the poor person, the poor child who inherited this farm just as it was becoming clear that having an 80-acre farm was no longer viable, and that child had to make the painful decision to let this farm go to ruin. And you hoped that it was an easy decision, but knowing how stubborn these people are, you could imagine somebody fighting, clawing, trying to hold on year after year, working in town and farming on weekends, and just running their boat up the rocky coast of grief and depression as far as they could, and then when the motor gives out, they go ashore and try and walk. These are stubborn, stubborn people. You cruise past and comfort that the people who founded this farm around the time of the Civil War could not have dreamed of to ride in luxury with this engine firing 6,000 times a minute and with a little heater under your seat and music playing on the radio, they could not have dreamed that this would be possible for ordinary working people. And yet, though it seems like such a different world from the world that they occupied, still it's the same universe. These were people with a primal faith in the sun and in rain and the sun is still there and the sun is still 99.98% of the mass of everything in our solar system and Jupiter is most of the rest and earth is just this little tiny tiny speck circling around the sun and there are a hundred billion other suns as big as this one just in the Milky Way. And beyond the Milky Way, there are a hundred billion other galaxies. That's the macrocosm. And the microcosm is equally fascinating. I was reading in the paper the other day that each cell in our body has a DNA, a coil that if uncoiled, makes an invisible string, an invisible skein six feet long, and with 50 trillion cells in your body, it means that each of us is composed of an invisible string that is 950 million miles, 10 times the distance from Earth to the sun. So we are amazing and complex. Even Norwegian bachelor farmers <laughs> are amazing and complex. The farm that I saw in ruins was the Peterson farm, and Victor Peterson was the last of the Petersons to live on it. He was a man who filled up that old house. He could never pass up a bargain. He could never throw anything away that might theoretically be useful. And this habit made him unmarriable. There was a little space in the house around his hot plate and there was a little bit around his bed and that was just about it. Everywhere else there were boxes and boxes full of tools and coffee cans full of nuts and bolts and coffee cans full of tape cassettes. He loved polkas and shadishes and waltzes. He loved old-time music. 
He played them on a boom box that he carried around with him at all times. You could hear him coming down the street, Victor Peterson. It was his trademark. Never listened to the radio, carried this boom box. And as he got older and older and harder and harder of hearing, you could hear him coming from farther and farther away, <laughs> carrying polkas and shadishes around with him. He had no toilet in the house, no running water. He had a pump in the barn. He got his water from a hose. He kept it running all through the winter, a big sheet of ice all the way down the hill from that water. He used a pail for a toilet, and he bathed by filling up a big steam kettle with water and leaving it out in the sun, and then he'd bucket it over him and rinse himself. Somebody said, well, what do you do in the winter? He said, well, the winter's not that long. <laughs> he was an oddball. People enjoyed him. He came to town every day to eat his lunch at the Chatterbox Cafe and talk to Darlene, the waitress, and he was kind of a pal of hers and liked to talk to her and always promised her that he'd take her out dancing some night, but he never did. He was always going with somebody else. He went out dancing every Wednesday night, old time music night, with a lady from Holdingford. She was unmarried and they'd go out every Wednesday, they'd go to, they'd go to Granite Falls, that far out west, or they'd go to Melrose, or go any place where there was a polka band playing. And they would dance as long as the band would play. And they'd twirl round and round the floor. They never sat out a dance. She was a big woman, and she wore blonde wigs, and she had this deep, rutted, ancient face and bright red lipstick. This big fire plug of a woman and a short man with, with a white fringe of hair sticking out from under his feed cap. But they were like a polka machine. Went round and round and round and round the floor and kicking up their heels. They danced and they danced and they danced. Wally at the sidetrack tap asked Mr. Peterson once if she was his girlfriend. And Victor said, no, I should say not. When somebody dances that well, why would you ruin it with a lot of love and romance? <laughs> no, they only went dancing. And then when she had a stroke and she had to go to the nursing home, he discovered that on cable television at 3 o'clock in the morning on Friday, Saturday morning, was an old-time dance program, and he told her about it. And he got cable TV there in that wreck of a house full of boxes of tools and stereo equipment and all sorts of useless things. He got cable TV and he would watch, and she would watch. And sometimes he would call her up on the telephone, and they would dance over the telephone. He would get up and dance, and she could hear him moving around. And she would dance in her own mind. And when she died, he didn't go to her funeral. He didn't believe in funerals. But in her honor, he came to the sidetrack tap and got royally, royally drunk. He got drunk until he finally felt like saying his piece. He said, you people look down on me and I know it. I've known it all my life. You look down on me because I don't have the possessions that you do. Well, let me tell you something. I never wanted them. Never needed them. I've got what I want. I'll compare my life to yours anytime. All you just working for your wives, that's all you're doing. <laughs> buying furniture you don't need, buying furniture you don't care for, buying cars you could get along without, all sorts of stuff you could get along without. In order to have things you don't want, you're leading lives you don't like. Well, you're looking at a free man. Our ancestors who came here from Norway, they knew they had a bad deal over there. Land was rocky and their 
Fathers treated them like slaves, so they got on a boat and they never looked back. They came, they came to Minnesota. And when they got here, a good many of them discovered it was just as bad a deal here, and they kept on moving. <laughs> they didn't look back. Well, I'm not going to look back either. You think I'm going to stay here the rest of my life? You're kidding. And that's when he started to move out. He just closed up his house, and he drove his car away. And he drove his car down to Florida, down to the little town that this cable TV old-time music show was telecast from. And he went dancing every night. Senator K. Torvaldson went down to see him about a year or so ago and reported back that he was a happy man. He was tan and trim, and he had about eight or ten old ladies who were flirting with him up one side and down the other. This man could go out to dinner any night of the week and never pay. He had all the dance partners he could ever, ever wish for. He died there a couple of weeks ago. They found him at home. He had a big quart of ice cream on his lap. He was eating it. And it had all melted. And the tape was going around in the boombox, flapping around. He died eating ice cream, listening to polka music, and waiting for a woman to come and take him dancing. Now who could wish for more than that? <laughs> they brought him back and they buried him next to his parents. And now at last that old farm can go to ruin once and for all, and nobody, nobody worry about it or feel bad about it. Ruin is what we all come to in the end. And remember that those portraits of Lincoln and Washington, those were their official portraits. But they were not only officials. They were also human. Washington loved to dance and Lincoln loved jokes and stories. So, if there is an appropriate way to spend President's Day weekend, I guess that would be it. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Thank you.